Hey, how's it going? Coach Madden, YougoProBaseball.com. I'm here with Isaac Hess. Isaac was actually a guest on my podcast, Behind the Seams, and we got to talk and I got to learn his story. Really cool story. There was a lot of adversity that he overcame in the story, and I just wanted him to share that story with you guys here because I think there's a lot to learn, a lot to um, that you, you could possibly take. If you're uh, an aspiring baseball player, a pitcher, he was a former professional pitcher, left-handed, there's just a lot of stuff that I really want you to take from his story and learn from. So, uh, Isaac, I don't even know where we, we should start. I don't even remember where we started in the podcast, but just a great story. Tell us, how'd, how'd you get started in baseball and then take us from there? All right. Well, thanks for having me here um, and on the podcast. It was awesome. Uh, so first of all, I've been a baseball lifer. As soon as I started playing baseball when I was nine, I fell in love with it. I had awesome coaches from, you know, especially my 11 and 12 year old coaches. They motivated me a ton. Shout out to Tom and Paul. Thanks, guys. Um, so from there, I knew baseball, you know, I had clarity in my mind when I was 12. I knew for sure that I wanted to play baseball in the big leagues. Not only did I want to play baseball in the big leagues, I knew that I wanted to be on the Diamondbacks and win a World Series. I envisioned myself getting tackled in Game 7 by all the players from the bullpen running in and just that entire scene vividly. And I would envision that consistently as a young kid. And that's really what I wanted to do my whole life. Um, I was really fortunate to have a very supportive mother who always you know she didn't have a lot but she knew that she would always provide whatever she could for me to maintain a baseball journey um so i was really lucky in that regard i did also have a lot of hip problems i had something called leg calf herthes disease um it happens up to about one in 20 kids or one in twenty thousand uh young kids anywhere from the ages of four to seven generally speaking it's a tough, tough road for the people that have it, and um, it really affects the childhood a lot and the families because essentially what happens is that your bone doesn't develop properly. Your, your uh, fem femoral head, the femur of inside of your pelvis bone, doesn't develop properly, um, and it comes out of place a bit, which causes an interruption in the blood flow, which ultimately causes a, a part of the bone to die. It's called avascular necrosis and then that causes osteoarthritis um, so by the time I was 19 I woke up every morning feeling like I had like an, a 95 year old hip I just felt like uh, creaky you know I felt terrible it hurt a lot and I was taking up to 12 ibuprofen by the time I was 19 years old 12 ibuprofen a day just to kind of get by so um, it didn't ultimately affect me pitching. The adrenaline, I was able to use the adrenaline to overcome the pain. And you know, as my body got loose, I was able to continue keep performing. And it was my, my left leg, so it was my drive leg. Um, it wasn't my landing leg. I was just, I was able to make it work. Um, but by the time I was 19, I had went to Washington State University on a full ride scholarship after my freshman year at South Mountain Community College in Arizona. Um, was a dream come true to get a scholarship like any other kid that is trying to play in, in the big leagues and, and take the path of going to college. I was ecstatic about getting the scholarship. I drove up to Washington the first day that I was there. They told me I wasn't going to get cleared to play and that I needed to get a total hip replacement and that I should really just cut, cut baseball out of my life entirely and stop. Um, they said I should try to wait until I was 30 years old to get a hip replacement because they, they wear out and that they only last 15 to 20 years. Um, I didn't listen to, to that. I didn't want to listen to that. And so that, that is one thing also as a side note, like you don't always have to take the doctor's word for it. The doctor does not, is not God. If the doctor says you're, you only got three months to live or you're, you only got this much time to do this or that, you don't have to take the doctor's word for it all the time. You have to take ownership of whatever it is that you're focused and determined to do. The, their, their word is not the end all be all. So that's just a little side note for anybody that might be going through any injuries or have any, anything that's tough that a doctor is telling them that they're up against the wall. So you determine your, your future in that, that regard. So <clears throat> after I was 19 and they told me that at, at uh, Washington State, I ended up getting a second opinion. I thought I was done maybe, but I, I didn't want to be done. So I got a second opinion from another doctor who said that I was eligible to get the hip replacement at that age. And I decided I was going to do it. He said he was willing to do it. 
His name is Dr. Michael Wilmink out of Phoenix. Another shout out to him, best hip doctor in the whole world if you ask me. He believed, he, I think he saw it in my eye, he told me I wouldn't recommend going back to playing, but I'm not going to tell you it's impossible. Um, I started doing my research, I found out that Bo Jackson was the only other player in history to ever get a total hip replacement and come back to play a professional sport. Um, to this day, I'm pretty sure nobody else has actually ever played a, a professional major sport. I know there's golfers and stuff, but nobody's ever played baseball with a total hip replacement except for me and Bo Jackson. Um, and I ended up finding a guy named Mac Newton, who is the guy that rehabbed Bo Jackson back to being able to play when he came back for the two years he, he came uh, back to play. So Mac Newton is a super guru guy. He's a Taekwondo teacher, a super motivational guy in my life, um, guy I consider my life coach and mentor still to this day. Um, he has a double hip replacement, and he's over 70 years old now, still doing a lot of teaching of Taekwondo. Very, very inspirational person. So um, having that path and experiencing meeting him and um, knowing that I wanted to continue playing, uh, there was nothing that was going to stop me. So when I was 19, right after getting my, uh, or right before getting my hip replacement also, I experienced something that was pretty difficult. Um, I don't know if I said this in the uh, podcast, but um, my dad had just passed away when I was 19 at Washington State. And then I came back. I knew I was getting a hip replacement after getting a second opinion. And then right before I was supposed to get that done, my mom passed away. So I dealt with both of those and then needing to get a hip replacement and then trying to go back and play, pro play college ball. So. It was tough, it was a tough year, but after that happening to my mom, there was no option for me to stop. I was gonna play, I was never gonna stop. I was gonna work as hard as I could. I was gonna do everything in my power to make it you know, as far as I could for her. So um, after that, I ended up going to University of Arizona with the total hip replacement, rehabbing every day um, with the intention of being able to get cleared to play at U of A. Uh, at U of A, they were, were recruiting me at the same time that Washington State was, but Washington State just gave me a much better offer, so I decided to move forward with going uh, to that school. But I was on the radar of U of A, so thankfully they knew who I was. I knew Coach Wazikowski there at the time. Um, he had recruited me, and then I started just bugging the crap out of him. I went to him every single week. I remember going 14 Mondays in a row on my bike, peeking my head in his office, asking him if he could get me on a summer league team because I was rehabbing a play. I was going to be throwing 90 with a nasty curveball, and I was going to be ready to add value to the University of Arizona Wildcat baseball team by the time I was a senior. Uh, Fast forward, he never ended up getting me an opportunity to play summer ball, but I think he respected my persistence and my resilience. So he did give me kind of a one-on-one -on -one shot to throw him a, a bullpen for him, and I threw a great bullpen. I was ready. I was strong. I, I was focused. I didn't end up getting cleared to play at U of A. Why? Because I had a total hip replacement. So that was kind of uh, unbeknownst to me. I didn't realize it was going to happen like that. Again, I thought baseball was done. I was pretty lost. But I had a really good mentor named John Kazanis who encouraged me. He was a, a White Sox scout for, he still is to this day, for over 35 years. He's the guy that got Mark Burley drafted. I was thinking of Walker Bueller. But he, uh, he was a really good mentor and positive influence in my life. And he encouraged me to go to a White Sox trial. Um, I remember it was March 3rd, 2007 at Tucson Electric Park at 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, I decided to go. And I threw about a 30-pitch bullpen and did really well. And then J.J. Lally called me over. He's a scout. I don't know where he's working now, but I think he's still with the White Sox. Um, he called, he, I was one of the five out of like the 50 guys that threw bullpens that he called over. And, you know, if, you, if you're in pro ball, you know the spiel. They, they say, you guys all are legit pitchers, but we don't have any places for you now. Um, so good luck. Maybe they get you an independent ball tryout or something or, or a spring training invite. So. I ended up getting an invite to spring training uh, with the Windy City Thunderbolts in the Frontier League in 07. Packed up my car, uh, drove out to Chicago from Tucson thinking that I was like locked up on the team, like I couldn't get released. Didn't have any idea how pro ball worked whatsoever. Didn't know that I could have gotten released before ever even throwing a pitch. Um, but thankfully I was ignorant to that and I ended up coming and throwing a couple bullpens. 
Turns out I ended up being, uh, <clears throat> what was it, 8-0 at the All-Star break, and I ended up making the All-Star team, uh, and I pitched sec I was the, I threw the second inning uh, of the All-Star game, and then we ended up winning the, the whole championship that year. It was like a fairy tale. I ended up getting MVP of the championship series, and then J.J. Lally followed it the whole time. I kept in touch with him. Um, you know, he's the guy that got me the invite initially to the Windy City Thunderbolts, and he tried to sign me to the White Sox squad. Um, he was going to send me to low A. I didn't get cleared to play by the White Sox because I had a hip replacement. So I, I pretty much battled that my whole life uh, of pro ball. It happened four times uh, total. So that happened with the White Sox. I came back. We went, I went to Windy City again. In Windy City, we won the championship for the second year in a row. Um, I threw a no-hitter that year. I ended up getting uh, named number six overall scout or number six overall prospect in independent ball of the whole country and the top left-handed pitcher on that list also. So I was on the radar. I was on the map. I, I'd hit 92 that year on the gun. So, you know, that was, bef that was in 08 before every single professional team had a 100, 100 mile an hour thrower or two. So, you know, 91 as a lefty with, with uh, good stuff was still going to be on the radar. I, sh I should have had an opportunity to play affiliated ball, but it ended up that I did well that second year, and then I got signed by the Padres again that offseason after 08. Again, didn't clear me to play because of my hip replacement. Uh, Grady Fuson, the, the guy that signed me there, uh, loved me, said that he, uh, I was going to be at him and Bill Brick, actually. Bill Brick, another shout out to Bill Brick. He's an awesome guy. He big mentor of mine. Um, both those guys believed in me and they wanted to give me a shot, but ultimately the people that had the power said no. So then I went to Victoria and played for the Victoria Seals in the Golden Baseball League in 09. Ended up starting the All-Star game that year. I was, that was the best season of my life. Uh, got signed by the Red Sox again. That was, this is the third time I got signed. This time they flew me over right after the All-Star game. Literally two days later, I packed up. They flew me over to Boston to get a physical um, from the main team doctor. I told Steve Peck, just name dropping all over here, told Steve Peck, that the scout that signed me there, that I, uh, I have a hip replacement, Steve. There's no secret here. I want you to know that I have a hip replacement and, I, and nobody's gonna be surprised. He said, we know, we also know that you can pitch and we just need to go get you a physical to clear you to play and you'll be good to go. We just need to fly you over to Boston. So I sat in the room in, in Boston for two days after talking to the doctor and the doctor said, you know, you're only 24. It's crazy that you're pitching professionally. You know, you're not supposed to really be doing this. But I said, doc, are you going to clear me to play or not? What's the deal? And he said, I don't know yet. And I went back to the hotel. Long story short there, they flew me back to Victoria. They didn't clear me to play. So then I finished the season out there, and then I ended up going to Mexico. Uh, pitched pretty well in Mexico. I was trying to go international with the intention of maybe going to, to play in Japan and then try to like roundabout my way into the big leagues um, without ever playing minor league ball. So that was kind of my vision. I didn't want to give up, uh, you know, so I just kept going. Then the, la the last and final time after pitching in Mexico, I got the, for the fourth year in a row, I got signed by the Diamondbacks. Not signed, I got all the way up to talking to Dr. Lee, who was the head doctor there. He even said that he was willing to clear me to play, even though there was no real precedent set of anybody with a hip replacement except Bo Jackson. And then I, I begged the, the vice president of operations there, I forgot his name right now, but Got to talk to him for about 20 minutes, just begging for him to give me a chance. Told him I would do whatever it takes. Told him I would sign any pieces of paper. I even got a lawyer along the way. John Harrison, awesome friend of mine still, um, really went to bat for me trying to get it so that I could get cleared to play. Didn't end up working out. Ended up going to Winnipeg after that, and then ended up going to the Atlantic League after that, and then hung him up after playing in this other league in Arizona, um, Freedom Professional Baseball League after seven years. But, you know, obviously I can tell that story. I've told it a couple times. I can talk about it. It's just still very fresh in my mind. Um, 
and it's ultimately what's brought me to sitting here at this table with you today, I think, you know, and just being able to continue the path. And where has that path taken you now? Uh, we talked about, we shot a bunch of videos today. We talked about a lot of baseball stuff, we talked about entrepreneurship. We talked about providing value, whether it's in the baseball community or not. What do you got going on now with everything? So obviously dealing with the adversity that I dealt with throughout my path, um, I feel like it's completely necessary to teach kids from a young age to play for something bigger. You know, if you have the possibility to play for something bigger, I always had an internal driver that made it easy for me to get up and do the work, even though I felt lazy that day. I, I had something deep inside of me pushing me. So for those of us, you know, a lot of guys in independent ball really have that, you know, they wouldn't be in independent ball if they weren't grinding and trying to continue making it. So I was always surrounded by different unique stories. Um, so that's kind of how MADE came about. MADE stands for motivation, appreciation, dedication, every day. And every day, the EVE is always capitalized because that was my mom's name. So I always say every day counts. And, you know, that's kind of the message that I'm always trying to give to the kids that I teach. And it's just baked into everything that I do, um, the intention behind everything that we do. Um, you know, it gets a little deep for the youth kids and stuff, but I think it resonates for the, you know, the uh, high school, college kids, even the pros that, you know, might hear this story. But I hope to have the opportunity to inspire those that come after me. But that also has brought me to the entrepreneurial journey of creating Cage List. Um, you know, Cage List now is a, is a marketplace for backyard batting cages that I've created. I've kind of learned web development over the, the years and, and I always wanted to work for myself and that's why I created MADE and, and being a baseball instructor and using the skills that I've learned to give those back and create a business out of it. And then the next phase was Cage List now as a, as a project to be able to provide a, a means for families who are dedicated to this game to make some side money, especially, you know, middle class families that have made that leap into investing five, ten thousand dollars into their, their kids dream. Now they can put it on Cage List, list it easily and then be able to rent it out for an hourly rate to the people in their community. So they're kind of competing with that indoor facility now. They're not, I don't really look at it as competition, but ultimately it's just creating a more broad, a broader landscape and opportunity for young players to train and a dad to have an opportunity to go hit um, in, a, in a place that's convenient and affordable right down the street. And then that family makes money off of being able to sell that cage time. Really cool story, really cool stuff you got going on. Um, I appreciate you coming out. You came all the way from Los Angeles, California, flew here. We're in Central Florida. Even though it doesn't look like it, doesn't feel like it right now. It's, it's cold. cold right now. <laughs> but uh, if you guys have a similar story, or, or I know everyone has a story, let us know. We want to hear your story. Hop down in the comments below and let us know what you got going on, what roadblocks you're encountering. You know, maybe we can have some uh, advice for you. At least hopefully this story uh, helped you, motivated you, inspired you in some way. And uh, of course, check out Made Baseball if you're ever in the Los Angeles, California area, and Cage List as well. I'll leave all the information in the comment sec uh, in the description down below. So go check it out. And uh, Isaac and I will be happy to talk to you down there. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for sharing your story, Isaac. Thanks for listening to me ramble on. Appreciate it. <laughs> I'll see you in the next one.